an intrepid team of scientists and engineers from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution is about to travel into the unknown. To a part of the ocean known as the Twilight Zone. A mysterious layer between the sea floor and the surface. It's one of the last frontiers of ocean science. We know less about it than the bottom of the ocean, which we know less about than the surface of the moon. And Doni Lavery is heading up the expedition. The Twilight Zone is dark. It's deep. It's hard to get instruments down there. As the world's fishing fleets begin targeting these new depths, scientists are rushing to understand as much as they can before it's too late. There's more that we don't know about the Twilight Zone than what we do know about the Twilight Zone. Failure could have unexpected consequences for global climate and ocean life. It's a race against time. For hundreds of years, we've wondered what lives at the bottom of the oceans, marveled at life at the surface, but rarely stopped to think what lies in between? From somewhere in the depths of the sea, at 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 feet, in regions where sunlight almost ceases to exist, there is an echo of sound. In the late 1940s, military sonars detected something strange in the ocean. Who or what reflects that sound? At first, they thought it was the bottom of the sea. Above the ocean floor, in some echo sounder tracings, a second floor seemed to appear. But when they saw it moving, they soon learned it was something entirely different. They were witnessing one of the greatest spectacles on Earth, a massive nightly migration, the largest on the planet. Every evening, as the sun sets, squid, microscopic zooplankton, and more life than the rest of the ocean combined migrate to the surface from the dark depths of the ocean twilight zone, a layer of ocean 650 to 3,000 feet below. They form a thick layer of life known to oceanographers as the deep sound scattering layer. Some scientists believe as much as 95% of all the fish in the ocean could live here. But as the sun rises, they sink back into the abyss, where nearly everything about them is shrouded in mystery. Some of the actual questions that remain about the Twilight Zone are which organisms actually move, uh, migrate from deep uh, from the deep ocean, from the twilight zone, up into the shallow waters to feed, and which ones don't? How far do they move? What triggers that migration? These are questions that we would like to um, understand better. The team cruises 10 hours southeast to a location about 100 miles off the coast of Newport, Rhode Island. Here, the edge of the North American continental shelf drops off 6,500 feet into the abyss. On board is one of the world's most advanced tools for ocean exploration. It's specially built to reveal the ocean twilight zone's mysteries. It's known as deep sea. It's equipped to visualize life from the smallest zooplankton to the largest whale in real time. It uses an array of sophisticated sonar systems used together for the first time. And an array of specially built camera systems for seeing animals nearby. A 3D camera for viewing mostly transparent animals. A powerful low light camera to see animals actively avoiding the vehicle or not in its direct path and a remarkable new holographic camera to see microscopic life in action. 
All combined, Deep Sea's multitude of cutting edge sensors will allow scientists to get the most complete picture of life in the ocean twilight zone to date, which might ultimately help protect it. The twilight zone is one of those last frontiers that we have where perhaps we can understand uh, the ecosystem before we exploit it, so that perhaps we can sort of manage it in a sustainable fashion. Just as Andoni's team sets out to explore the ocean twilight zone, commercial fisheries are beginning to set their sights on the deep. This unique habitat now faces its greatest threat. Much of the ocean twilight zone lies in international waters, far from any coastline. In these high seas, few laws govern the fisher's catch. Several countries already have fleets exploiting the ocean twilight zone. And as nearshore fish populations decline, it's a fishery that's set to grow. Scientists are only just beginning to understand the global importance of life in the deep sound scattering layer. Trillions of animals, including fish, shuttle massive amounts of carbon from the ocean's surface to the depths by consuming phytoplankton, microscopic organisms that use energy from sunlight and the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide to produce food. When the digested phytoplankton is excreted, it sinks to the depths with the carbon and remains there for hundreds of thousands of years out of the atmosphere. By fishing out the ocean twilight zone, we would tamper with the ocean's ability to absorb carbon dioxide, potentially amplifying the speed of climate change, harming not just life in the ocean twilight zone, but all life on our planet. The team is nearing the continental shelf. This cruise is our, our very first use of the deep sea, and this is principally a, a test and evaluation cruise, but done at a scientifically uh, relevant location. They've reached the deployment site, a deep-sided submarine valley known as Alvin Canyon, which dips more than 6,500 feet into the depths. Deep sea is about to enter the ocean twilight zone for the first time. This is a good site. It gets us into sufficiently deep water that we can do a lot of our engineering tests. My primary concern is still the deployment and recovery, especially as the sea state deteriorates. Deep sea is ready to go. The crew holds the guy lines attached to deep sea's sides, keeping it steady as it approaches the water any sudden movements could send it spiraling out of control. Oh, that's a relief. <laughs> yeah, you get the As deep sea sinks to the depths, it sends data back to the ship through a two and a half miles long fiber optic cable. The team monitors everything in the control room. Tension is high as the data comes in. They know that getting deep sea into the water is only the first hurdle. The forces of currents, both at the surface and in the depths, push and pull both deep sea and the ship it's tethered to in opposite directions. A broken cable could send deep sea barreling into the abyss. Yeah, can we take deep sea down to 200 meters? As deep sea sinks to the depths, pressures intensify. Then, success. Just as they near the upper boundary of the ocean twilight zone, 650 feet below the surface, they get their first incredible images 
of microscopic life from the holographic camera. This is just organisms that are in the water, so it's just taking snapshots as they, as they swim across. Deep Sea's holographic camera works by shooting a laser beam through the water column to a receiver a meter away. The receiver detects interference patterns in the beam, which it translates into images of microscopic organisms, which it sends back to the control room through the fiber optic cable, providing the team with a live action view of the ocean twilight zone's microscopic world. At the same time, Andoni is monitoring data from the multi-beam sonar, a device that detects animals avoiding deep sea by emitting a broad array of sound waves to detect animals both large and small swimming ahead of the vehicle. Those are individual okay. fish, basically. The green dots are... The green dots. By recording data about animals across the spectrum of life, Andoni and her team are set to become one of the few groups of scientists to send sophisticated acoustic sensors directly into the twilight zone to study what lives there. Uh, we've got a depth reading. We're about 10 meters or so, 10, 11 meters down. So we're going to go down another 10 meters. Deep sea enters the deep sound scattering layer. And immediately it detects a swarm of life. Uh, some of the science we've already seen is this very dense layers of zooplankton. We infer that they are, uh, it's a layer of siphonophores, which is a gas bearing zooplankton. It's a one millimeter pocket of gas that gives a very loud signal at selected frequencies. Siphonophores are gelatinous creatures. Most jelly-like creatures in the ocean are hard to study because they're fragile, transparent, and made mostly of water. But siphonophores are different. Small gas pockets in their bodies make them some of the few gelatinous creatures deep sea can detect. It's the first big discovery for the team. They sink further into the deep sound scattering layer. Suddenly, there's a problem. At 1,600 feet, the team loses communication with the vehicle. We stopped receiving the signal, and after a little debugging, it turned out that uh, there's some disruption in the uh, optical fiber. They have no choice but to abort the mission and get deep sea back on board. Before losing communication, deep sea sonars detected what looked like siphonophores and fish in the deep sound scattering layer. But the team can only confirm that by actually catching some of those animals. They send two net systems down to 650 feet, Mochness, for catching small, delicate zooplankton, and a trawl net for catching fast swimming fish and squid. They recover Mokdes first. Biologists Helena McMonagall and Paul Cager sort through the catch. I see so. Yeah. I saw a couple of fish larvae in there. There's a little fish larvae, yeah. The deep sound scattering layer didn't contain siphonophores as they thought, but salps. That's good news, because salps also have small air pockets in their bodies. They produce a very similar acoustic signal to siphonophores. It means deep sea sonars are working as they hoped. They also need to confirm that the multi-beam sonar was detecting fish. NOAA fisheries biologist, Mike Jack, identifies the fish they pulled up in the trawl net. We got a lot of mctophids. They're called lanternfish. A lot of the mctophids migrate up to the shallow water at night. More good news. This confirms the multi-beam sonar also works. Lanternfish are one of the most abundant fish on the planet. They're known to migrate daily with the deep sound scattering layer. Beyond simply confirming deep sea's data, the team also wants to better understand the role the animals play 
in transporting carbon to the deep ocean? And specially, which animals participate in the daily migration? Paul photographs the animals that made it to the surface alive to document characteristics like color and anatomy. But many of the animals cannot be identified by their physical features alone. That requires DNA sequencing back at Woods Hole. Helena freezes the animals with liquid nitrogen and then places them in a negative 80 degree freezer. Other animals are preserved whole in alcohol. Biologists will also look at their stomach contents to determine what and how much the animals ate before they were captured. This will help biologists gain a better understanding of the amount of carbon these animals transport from the surface to the depths. And in quantities so great, they play a major role in Earth's climate system by keeping carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. But mock nests and the trawl do not capture every animal in their paths. Most fish and squid are fast enough to escape them, and many ensnared jelly-like animals are destroyed long before they reach the surface. So to account for those missing animals, scientists are trying out a clever new method, one that involves forensic science. This device, known as a CTD, is carrying an instrument that captures a water sample at different depths. It's stored in these large gray containers. Molecular ecologist Annette Govindarajan is interested in the minuscule fragments of tentacles, scales, and excrement, which all contain traces of DNA, called environmental DNA, or eDNA. For animals especially that are hard to collect, we can find traces of their presence. Like, for example, jellyfish uh, that might get fall apart or destroyed when they're collected through nets. Fish that are active that might swim away from our instruments or from the nets. Those kind of animals that we might not otherwise detect, but we know that they're there. Once a net returns to Woods Hole, she'll sequence that DNA to determine which species were recently present in the water when the samples were collected. Her eDNA sampler will ultimately be attached to deep sea as a way of detecting animals it may have missed in its cameras and sonars. Combined, deep sea with the eDNA sampler will help the team construct the most comprehensive portrait to date of life in the ocean twilight zone. After five days, Andoni and the team are finally ready to deploy deep sea once more. We have completed all of our troubleshooting. Everything is now operational. Deep sea heads for the depths. The team watches anxiously in the control room. Deep sea reaches 650 feet, or 200 meters, the upper boundary of the ocean twilight zone. That's deep, but they can't be sure they've fixed the fiber optic cable without going even deeper. So we are now at 500. They've reached 1,600 feet, and the cable is still transmitting data. Their repairs worked. But as fish blink across the sonar screen, and the holographic camera bustles with activity, the team knows they need to push deep sea further. As the cable unspools, 
and deep sea sinks deeper, the stakes rise. To complete the mission, deep sea must continue on the lower boundary of the ocean twilight zone, 3,300 feet below. Hey, we did it. They've made it to 3,300 feet and have already made an astonishing discovery. There are still fish. Still fish. A thousand meters. Beyond the edge of the ocean twilight zone, there is no end to the masses of life forms they encounter. We went down to 1,200 meters. We found that there were fish all the way down to 1,200 meters. We kept looking for a depth where maybe there wouldn't be any fish. We couldn't find a depth where there were no fish. Beyond twilight and what looked like the lower boundary of the deep sound scattering layer, they expected life to taper off. We're seeing that that area that looks void <laughs> of biology yeah, they hold that is filled with it. It's just teeming with it. Our observations here are shattering a myth or oversimplified view of the marine biology in this twilight zone, that it's much more complicated than a single scattering layer that moves very simply up and down the water column. The, the water column is filled with different types of organisms all finding their, their own preferred layer, and they do indeed move up and down day and night. Having gone down as deep as they can go into the ocean twilight zone, Andoni and her team have proven that deep sea is ready to explore the life here and reveal its greatest secrets. <laughs> After completing a test and evaluation cruise that surpassed all expectations, the team heads back to port. And Doni is eager to begin the next phase of work. Recognizing the question is the first challenge. The second one is designing the instrument. The third one is completing the development of the instrument. And you do the test and evaluation. What you really want to get to is the science. So it's been a little tantalizing. I wish we'd had a bit more time to go from test and evaluation and engineering mode into spend a week or two doing the science. So the next steps are to take the nuggets of science that we did manage to get to and really digging through the data and coming up with some robust hypotheses that we want to test for next time. Deep Sea is giving us new hope for understanding how the ocean twilight zone and Earth's greatest concentration of life is so critical to the planet's life support systems. At a time when our planet teeters on the brink of catastrophic change, Deep Sea is already providing a rare window into the ocean twilight zone and may one day help us live more sustainably on this planet we call home. <laughs> <laughs>